Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we I can, can hear yeah. you. Yes. Okay, excellent. Yes, we can. And so we meet. We meet in yeah. person, almost, kind of. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, here we are. So today we have uh, Michael Thomas of Sharon. Is that how you say it? Sharon? Sharon? Sharon, I don't know this place. Yeah. Sharon, right. So you're like Da Vinci. You've uh, adopted the name of where you're from. It's absolutely it makes it sound a more... <laughs> medieval type of uh, calling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least that's your handle on the Twitter. And uh, yeah, Sharon, is it somewhere in New York? I take it. I don't know. Up, yeah, um, upstate. Obviously outside New York State. Yep. Yep. Upstate New York, about uh, five hours from New York City North. Uh, just because it occurred to me right this moment, were you like a city boy from like New York before that or? Um, no, not from oh. New York proper, but I was downstate for a considerable amount of my youth. Um, but I moved up here maybe 21 years ago at this point when I was 19. Oh, yeah, yeah, very good, very good. So I should say who you are and everything, I guess, before I get into it. So you're a, um, on Twitter, you're sort of somewhat famous. Um, you are interested in you. We, we you we you want to talk about distributed distributism, agrarianism. And these are these are what we will ask you about because I'm interested in these things as well. I'm quite jealous of your setup, to be honest. And uh, I believe you how your faith uh, ties into this, and your you sort of encompass your entire worldview in a in a sort of self um, self contained. System <laughs> that works. So, the so, uh, so I'm not putting it. I'm not. Pardon me for not putting it uh, very well there. And with me today also is sorry, Stang, Stang Glass Zealot. Yep, I uh, contacted yeah. you two together, so uh, I'll guide you <laughs> through this conversation. Exactly. Exactly. He shall guide us. So yeah, maybe tell tell us a little bit then uh, what you can in your own words, what how you would describe what you're doing. Well, um, well, we've been for about eight years. We've lived at this homestead, which I'm, which I'm in right now. It was built in 1799. Um, served as kind of a mixed uh, homestead level farm for the entirety of its uh, existence. It has it had a brief period as a commercial dairy operation uh, in the post-war period, but outside of that, it's always kind of been a, a, a mixed farm. Um, we came here and planted about 1500 cider apple trees so we're growing bittersweet cider varieties and from the pursuit of of that emerged a type of preoccupation with uh, a traditional agrarian technique um a bittersweet cider making and, and kind of natural cider making was not something that folks in america were familiar with and so in our pursuit of that um, kind of revealed to us uh, uh, a whole pathway, a deeper pathway into traditional thought and traditional um, practice. And so you say, you know, you, you opened with the idea of, you know, your life is expressive of your values. It's very much true that that um, for me, this was not, uh, it was, this has been a tandem uh, uh, practical pursuit that emerged into an intellectual and eventually a spiritual pursuit and not the other way around um and so yeah and so um and so in that process the faith of my ancestors was revealed to me i would spend long hours it, it, human scale labor tending trees and animals um out in our fields and uh and in that process the trinity was revealed to me in a very powerful way and i returned to the catholic faith of my ancestors through that witness um, and so, uh, that was happening while in tandem, I was reading Catholic social theory and, and kind of the things that I were thinking were being echoed by men a hundred years ago, uh, in, in the form of distributism and in the form of subsidiarity and some of these Catholic social theory ideas. Um, and so I have this, 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 an intellectual path that's bringing me deeper to Catholicism and then a practical path that's revealing the truth of the Trinity in Christ. And so, um, so between those two things, um, a, a very powerful traditionalism emerged in our, in our home and in our, in, in our life. And, um, and a feeling like we are, uh, that we have something to offer folks, especially, uh, p people who are interested in reconnecting with that, with that idea of, uh, traditional agrarianism and traditional agrarian practice. So 
to talk at a practical level, we have a small sheep flock. We grow probably about 50% of our own fo food, but could easily grow 100% at this point. Um, we are farm is self-contained, meaning that I don't use outside inputs. I don't use chemical fertilizers. I don't use chemical sprays. I don't use machinery. Um, I scythe all my hay. I, I turn all my soil with hand tools. And I make cider. I do make cider with uh, with a 220 engine that 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 squeezes the juice out. So there is there is that. Hopefully, eventually we'll we'll have a, a crank press. But um, but yeah. So that's that's the that's the process. That's 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 what we're doing. So there's like a luddism involved. There's a, an, an agrarianism involved. There's a traditionalism involved. And there's a deep. It's all really rooted. Um, in this pursuit of relationship with divinity and spirituality, uh, and particularly Catholic faith. Wow. Well, I got so many questions. <laughs> I don't even know. Bring them up. That's why I'm here. To, uh, I should have written down notes. I, uh, hold on. Let me think now. Okay. First of all, so this farm, and then I'll let um, Stan Glass ask a couple questions too. I'll just, I'll go through like three of the most obvious questions. Sorry, this farm, did you inherit it or did you buy it? Okay, yeah. So, so I lived in in a small years ago. City. Is that right? Yeah, you weren't city. raised with it. No, no, I was not raised with it. I, my wife and I lived in yeah. a smaller city. We were kind of small business people and saved up money and 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 always kind of had a dream of getting out to the country. And then after a long pursuit of kind of looking for the right spot, um, this farm <laughs> appeared about eight years ago, and we were like, "That's the place." Um, and so we've been here about eight years on this particular and started planting trees eight years ago. Right. And so it's very interesting that you went, you went, I was going to say backwards. It's not necessarily backwards. The way you went into traditionalism from hard labor on a, on a farm and growing things. And then that led to everything else. I think these things are always entwined, I guess. Like I sort of came to it through doing art and the same values <clears throat> over time came clear to me it, not just not just spiritual values but to say using the more simple simple tools that you use and the more you actually get use your own the sweat of your own brow the more important it is and the more um human and real the the artwork ends up to be and also i got very much more interested in gardening and and um agrarianism myself or as the all these things seem to be tied together and they lead to one another i guess oh <laughs> oh it, it seems natural i guess when you get more in touch with the, with the real world, the natural world. And um, I'll, uh, I've got too many questions, so I'll let's... Are you there? Yeah. yeah. It, it, did you drop? No, uh, okay. Um, I, I was wondering, like, how, how did uh, the Trinity lead to the development of your spirituality, or how did the Trinity reveal to you that... Or, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a great, you know, there was no, um, well, it was punctuated by several epiphanies, but then, but then it was a very, very long process as well. You know, I, I think I wandered like many Americans and probably moderns do in kind of a vague deism for a long time, um, kind of seeking divinity through the natural world. And I would have a practice where I would go and sit and kind of contemplate in a, in a set of oaks with a, with a set of, uh, there was a, an oak grove on our property that's very old in excess of 300 years. Um, but so I would sit and contemplate in those oaks, you know, and around those oaks. And while I worked, you know, uh, we talked about labor kind of revealing a spiritual path. I really like the quote of, um, St. Benedict, that when yeah. <laughs> when we pray while we labor, we lift our heart to to God. Um, something of that sort. I might have. Yeah, it is exactly that. I saved it for it's another question, but uh... <laughs> it's a beautiful quote. Um, so so in any event, so I, I would I would contemplate by these oak trees, and so uh, the the first stage of that was uh, in that vague deism, the the revelation of a oh, wow. No matter how much I pursue a materialistic understanding of farming or gardening or practice or or my orchard, that 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 thread always ends in mystery. And so in that mm. mystery, I saw I saw God the Father. I saw that that no matter how there's an infinite, you know, no matter how much I study there's a level of infinity that, that you reach where there's, you couldn't actually conceive as a human, the depth of connections uh, at the roots of the tree and in mystery, you can't see that. Um, and from, so that was a revelation for me of God the Father. And then, and then the second part um, 
I graphed lots of trees and I watched trees in a slow and quiet way over many, many years. And I began to feel the presence of a moving force in living things. Um, and at first I identified it as like a green line rising from the soil, from the, from the darkness of the soil. But, but I saw this yeah. will to life in all things. And that will to life, that mystery, that inspiration, that reach of the branches, well, that, was, that, that emerged for me the Holy Spirit. It's around that time that I started to chant while I pray. And the chants that emerged for me were Latin chants that my grandmother had taught me when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I'd strayed from my Catholic faith at this point. And, you know, it was, again, just kind of vague spirituality. But I'm chanting Ave Maria while I pray all day. You know, so I'm chanting and Mary starts leading me back to this tree. And after seasons of witnessing this, this, this it, one in particular oak over a series of seasons, I set like a four season path of sitting in contemplation with this one oak. And so I watched it through each season. And it was like deep in summer at one point. And I'm sitting there in my practice, just kind of witnessing this oak. I would spend, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, just kind of witnessing this tree. And I played the mind game of what would it be like if I was that tree? If I was that tree, how would I feel? You know, pretend I'm the tree. And I thought about it. And then I started looking at the tree and well, it's branches, you know, it's a very old oak. So half the branches are dead, you know, and, and kind of hanging there. And then the, the bugs are crawling into it and the, 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 the moss is eating it and the, the birds are poking at it. And I, all of a sudden I realized that this tree was in agony. <laughs> that this tree was, was, was like tortured by the world around it with his arms outstretched. And this is an epiphany moment for me because it was at this point where I, I saw Christ in that tree, that, that through that tree suffering, it was giving life to the entire world around it. And so then, and then that third aspect of, of God, I witnessed it as Christ in, in that in emerging in that oak in the living world. And I was just like, wham, at that point. And that was the, the, an epiphany moment for me where I was like, I need to return to the, the, the faith of my ancestors. And there's an, there's an absolute truth that is undeniable in what the Trinity reveals. And so I had God the Father in the mystery of the oak. I had the Holy Spirit in the will of life, the reach of the branch of the oak. And then I had Christ in the communion of the oak with all the animals and life around it and in the suffering that that entailed. And so, bam, you know, um, that there's the three aspects of the Trinity. And at that point, and this is all being revealed while I chant Ava Maria. And I was like, Whoa, oh, my that's God. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm not, still not considering myself Catholic at this point. And then all of a sudden, oh, right, I, my, I, my ancestors. When exactly did this happen? How long ago? Probably about maybe two to three years ago. Ooh. And then it even at oh, that that's recent. Yeah, that, that yeah. was longer. Yeah, we returned to a shrine. There's a local shrine by us of a saint, Saint Kateri. Uh, um, uh, it's a uh, she was one of the few Native American saints, and she is the patron saint of ecology. And so for a long time, I just visited that shrine. My kids like dropped their heads in a uh, in a pool uh, of a, a spring at this shrine and said, "Are we baptized now?" You know, and then these are my kind of somewhat like heathen children that I had raised. And, uh, and at that point I said, oh, there's ritual and there's all these things I, I must return in the proper way. And so we're walking back. My wife was raised Presbyterian. So she's returning to the to the Catholic roots of her ancestors in this in this journey. You know, I was baptized and confirmed, but the, the Catholic faith through this process is just emerging more and more and more powerfully. And so. And so, yeah, and so now my family is um, my family is going through the scrutiny of the church. Now we found an actual parish with the community that we're in now. So we don't we don't attend mass at the shrine as much anymore, but I have an actual community. Um, and that's you go to, you go to the to the Latin mass I saw as well. No. Yeah, there's, yes. it's harder to find, but there is a Latin mass about an hour from here. So my wife uh, has attended several Latin services. Um, I tend to make the early Sunday morning uh, service at a small rural church. That's our community church. Um, and so Because I saw you with a tweet on the suit and uh, you popped up in my timeline and I said, hmm, interesting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I don't that's... know why that, that one, but <laughs> that <laughs> that's when my... I contacted you. Yeah, my children's... Uh... My children's scrutiny. So at my, my, my children's first scrutiny, 
um, I we we I dressed up. You know. <laughs> and uh, can I ask how how old are your children? Do you have um, them working okay, on the so family? A one and a half year old. <laughs> oh, okay. A, Never mind. Uh, I have a nine year old. <laughs> I have an eleven year old, and I have a sixteen year old. Uh, ah, so, so you four, got some of them working. Yeah, yeah. Some of them. Someone are out there picking those apples. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. And like. <laughs> So, and when you, I, I'm, these are some of my other questions. I have to get to them. Sorry. So, um, in terms, because I am very interested in just to forgive me with your. So, you practice this sort of uh, no no dig stuff and all that sort of thing, right? Do you and you're probably an expert at making your own compost. No, you said yeah. the process. The process for your cider, you said, was some kind of uh, more ancient process. I'm, I'm guessing you don't add sugar or something because you said it was sour. I don't know that much about cider. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just fo I follow God's plan with my cider. I just, you know, I put the cider in an oak barrel and I take it out in a season or two. And there's no additives. Oh, right. Nothing, nothing but juice <laughs> enters the barrel. Amazing. Um, and cool. That's, yeah. And that's it. That's all that. That's all that uh, happens. I had a, I had a friend um, who was a minister, not a Catholic minister, but a local. Uh, you know, Protestant uh, minister, and he would come and help me every once in a while. We would talk, of course, and in him witnessing my cider barrels at one point, he said, you know, a lot of the work that I do happens in mystery too. You know, I just have to have faith that the work I do in the world transforms things in places that I don't see it. And so, yeah. you know, Christ's first miracle is, is the transformation of water into wine. And so there's something very uh, profound and 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 you know, again, uh, a, a type of revelation in the process of making cider. And so, making cider really, really naturally, making wine, making beer. Um, I was, I'm, I'm very much compelled to kind of remove myself from the process as much as possible and let the natural order of things emerge. So, uh, yeah, yeah, great, great. And can you, sorry, can you, can you buy this uh, online, this cider, or somewhere, or <laughs> is no. it just? Unfortunately, no. the uh, the laws in uh, New York State and in America oh, um, okay. is a, a deeper deeper conversation. But um, right, they're, they're, they'd they're make you add chemicals. Dirty. Yeah, it's hard to get everything regulated and permitted. And so right now, my cider is just given away to friends. Eventually, I'll I'll have enough right. fruit on my property that would substantiate the permit fees and everything to to make it an actual venture. But at this point. To, 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 to pay for all the fees, I don't have enough fruit to justify that. Uh, someday, I hope to. Mm -hmm. And are you able to manage this orchard just your, you and your family, or do you have to like hire laborers? Or no, just 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 me and my family. I'm trying to develop everything at at, at a, a manageable level for you know posterity that that is just within my family. I don't. I've right, I've right. passed the point of wanting to be an entrepreneur or have a big business. I just want to make enough to you know, pay our bills maybe. And, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's, I'm not, I'm yeah. not looking at having a, you know, no, I, I just, I just have no idea like how much work is involved or uh, plus you have the livestock and everything. So that's good. You're met, you're able to manage it all anyways with what, with what you have. Yeah. Yeah. That's the outside. idea. Yeah. Right. No, that's fascinating. And you had how many, was it sheep you said you had? Or yeah, was I have, it about, cows? I have about 15 sheep and they're an integral 15. part of managing the orchard since I don't use machinery. The sheep graze the orchard um, to keep the right. grass low. They fertilize right. the trees. Then yeah. we eat the sheep. Uh, you know, so everything is yeah, yeah, yeah. a relation. You know, this this idea of communion with the landscape and with all the different aspects of our farm is important to the way that we that we farm. Yeah, nothing is waste. That's what another thing you learn when you get into this using making your own things and your own materials. Almost nothing is waste, and it can yep. make you almost a bit of a hoarder at times. So you're like, you don't actually get rid of anything. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you use the wool? Do you shear the sheep and use the wool? Or? I haven't gotten to the level of using the wool for, for a long time. I was collecting it in bags and they were all piled in my barn. And then eventually, I think last season and two seasons ago, I just I just put it as mulch at all my trees. So now there's, oh. more, <laughs> there's, a, there's a nice... I didn't know that was good. Oh, so you can, I didn't, I didn't know that you could use that as mulch. I guess anything organic, you can pretty much use as mulch. That's what it is. This, this was the idea. Yeah. Wow. Cool. That's great. And um, uh, what was I going to ask you now? I lost the other. Oh, so so how does the um, distributism come into this? Are you practicing that, or is it just something you are working towards? Well, I would say I'm. Pra I said would say I'm practicing distributism. It's it's interesting because my um, right right to the curse of modernity that each one of us has to has to you know 
cook our own idea of how everything should work. You know, no one's left alone anymore to just follow a, the, the, the natural order of things or be part of a nation. We all have to cook our own political philosophies and everything else. So in that vein, you know, it, it leads a man to study. And uh, throughout my life, I've, I've, you know, put on different uh, understandings of what just social order looks like until eventually I said, I don't, I don't want to pay attention to that anymore. And I just would like to farm and, and be myself and, 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 yeah. you know, uh, kind of embody a bit more humility. And so from that though, eventually I, you know, reading, um, what, what emerged, I reading uh, Southern agrarian American thoughts. So, uh, uh, authors like Richard Weaver, authors like, um, uh, Wendell Berry, um, these people who were talking about agricultural process and practice and in America, and that led me, you know, to, to other thinkers who were connected to this agrarian line of thinking. And then that slowly led me down the path to read Pope Pius's, uh, uh the thirteenth encyclical. You mean um, Leo, no? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and in that encyclical, which is, which is really about man's relationship with the landscape. Um, and and uh, it was a reactionary uh, uh, encyclical to um, what was happening with uh, uh, communism spread in, in, in Eastern Europe mm. and Russia it, to some degree. I, I, again, I'm not a scholar, so I don't want to put myself out. I'm just a farmer who reads, you know. <laughs> um, but in any event, um, from that developed in me an interest in distributism that has kind of blossomed over the past year. Um, so Belloc and Chesterton and these other thinkers um, and me finding in distributism, uh, Father McNabb, who I've been reading recently, finding in distributism really um, and in Catholic social thought, uh, oh, wow, this is what I, I've meant. You know, this is this answers many of and, and gives much better words and language and context to many of the things that I was feeling. Um, and I think a lot of young men kind of wander with this political homelessness, not never, never kind of understanding where they fit and, and they try on different coats. And I, I was just like that, you know, um, until finally I realized that I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, you know, deeply a, a reaction. I, I have a deep reaction to modernity and, um, and that distributism offers a third path that doesn't buy into many of the political binaries that so many of us are trapped in. And that distributism quite simply is, that we all have a right to access to first things, that each of us, that all of our communities, that the most just ordered society is one in which people have access to first things. And what I mean by that is food, shelter, water, clothing, fuel, the first and primary things. And so much of modern society attempts to solve those problems by creating complicated government structure, or we can see it in UBI. They want to create a secondary medium in which you can participate in a market and get at first things, rather than just constructing a social order that brings people into contact with first things, because that's where God's grace resides. God's God's grace exists in the landscape for each of us to participate in that community of, of life. And, um, and so by governments or other social structures trying to mediate that, it's, it's a mediation between people's access to uh, divine order. And so very much so my time laboring in the landscape, Christ emerges for me, truth emerges for me. And I think so many people are barred from that process in their lives because they don't have access to first things. Yeah, and, and more and more the modern world is very urban and they don't even understand. They think these things just arrive magically out of nowhere or they don't, there's no, they don't even consider the process at all of where they get their things that they eat, the basic things, you know, right. the lumber and the, food and the meat or whatever, right? Yes. So it's just, it's just, just dishonest on the face of it to not have some connection with that. Even, you know, in the old days, I believe even city do the era of say even world war ii and obviously well all all the period of history before that even in the city everyone had a garden you, you might have a nice flower garden as well but you didn't waste your land without trying to you'd have a couple chickens and you'd have some cabbages or whatever so there was always that's something that's been totally excised and you're right it's abs absolutely vital that people 
at least try at some point to grow their own food and stuff like that. And it does connect you to reality and nature and to God. And, and it's very seasons. important. To and the, the seasons, seasons, yeah. The change and like the end and the harshness of it. You know, think it sometimes it doesn't work out and everything dies. And you know, it's it's a hard old slog. And uh, the other thing you said earlier, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you, so you you're like me as well. You, um, it's not that I'm anti technology, but whenever I can, doing my little things, I avoid using any kind of power tools or power machinery. <laughs> you know, I have all the old stuff that I use all the time. I collect these antique things and use them <laughs> when I'm doing anything. So yeah, like uh, I don't know. For myself, it's I, like I think of it. Well, I, I, I th it started with me when I read about old carpenters and that, and how the real carpenter, the guy that would really do it, he just had his little toolbox. He didn't have a bunch of plug-in uh, saws and things. He'd just arrive anywhere with his toolbox and make you anything or fix anything right there. So the real skill was just to have a few chisels and a few hammers and things and do it that way. So that's how I arrived at that. So you have, how did you come around to the, because a lot of people would think like us, like you, but would still succumb to users and machinery. <laughs> What, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? You know, t I would answer that question different a year ago or two years ago than I would now because I'm steeped in the language of Father McNabb right now and, and other distributist thinkers. Um, okay. So I'm going to answer with, with, with the way that I think I've come to understand it. Um, I've always had an aversion to these things. I don't know why I've always had that aversion, but I have. Um, <laughs> Putting that aside, I think that in the same way that I talked about material access to first things, um, just because I have access to uh, lumber doesn't mean that I can build a house. And so in order to have a, a society, a just order in society where people have access to first things, we not only have to cultivate that material access, but we also have to cultivate the traditions and the patterns of craft skills that cultivate in people the know-how and the ability to commune with first things, house building, farming, you know, all, all the beautiful crafts for the ages. This is something that's, you know, the church has cultivated in people for for millennia, right? For for a very long time. And so if we use and participate in high technological forms, we don't just carry uh, that that individual piece of technology. When I when I pick up a drill gun, it was manufactured somewhere else besides me. I plug it into a wall, which follows it back to a power plant. And so I'm using that corded drill gun within a whole context of technological infrastructure that it mediates me for my ability to actually access first things. And so I would give words to my technological aversion now is that we must cultivate the basic crafts uh, and the tradition of crafts without the mediation of high technology in order to ensure for posterity um, that that we have access to those things because it's very easy that that someone could say no longer do you have access to high technology you know um, no longer is there a global supply chain which supplies it and then our ability to access first things vanishes and so um, yeah. again so so this this idea is that it's not just the cultivation of the material access but also the cultivations of, of the means of production to use a, a, a political term you know that the, the and means of production is also know-how skills and tradition um and, yeah. and the tradition yeah. of crafts you know if you I, I tried to farm with horses and I did so in great poverty because I had no mentor to teach me. The line of tradition of, of horse care was broken for me. And it was it was an insurmountable cliff for me to climb back up, you know? Um, yeah, I imagine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so- I imagine, so yeah. My, so you were, you, my, you were just like looking at YouTube videos. This is not a way to learn how to work with horses. <laughs> <laughs> I need I needed an uncle or a father or a neighbor to truly show me, but that line of tradition was broken. And so once we lose these things, they're very, very hard to regain. And so there becomes this critical nature. Yeah. So my aversion to technology is less an aversion to technology, although that exists. I, I, I do not believe in the idea of technological neutrality. I think I would fall in line with thinkers like Alul and other and others who would say um, the appropriate technology movement of the 60s and 70s. Uh, I can go on and on about kind of anti-tech thought, but really now it just rests yeah. in that in order to preserve tradition, 
um, I, I want to learn the uh, the old ways of doing things before their usurpation with technological, uh, you know, high tech technological tools. So um, yeah, timber framing, and then then it's as, like a process. Yes, timber framing, masonry work. Um, uh, you know, rather than snap together plastic buildings or, you know, um, th th these types of things are going to draw me because they bring me into closer possession of the cultivation of tradition and access to how to use the material around me as God intended to provide for my needs. Yeah, because I find like it goes, it becomes a process within a process within a process and there's so many stages in between and What was I going to say? The um, when you're making something, or when you're doing it for yourself, and you have the you, not only do you have that first hand experience, you learn for yourself. So now you can teach your kids the horsemanship that you didn't have. But I also find, like, saying things with the example of the horse, it brings me to mind. I always think the technology, like, say we're using this technology. Yeah. You even use the example of the car versus the horse or the tractor or whatever. You know, the tractor does have its plus sides and you're saving yourself a lot of labor, let's say. But it's not a 100% improvement across the board. Like, what did I, I often say, the horse, is a, the horse is a car that runs on grass. You know, it just <laughs> generate. If you think if you think in that long-term way, it really has more value in many ways. Or even... I said this, I made a post about this recently. Everyone thought I was joking, but I'm serious <laughs> about using a chainsaw versus um, just using a big saw and an ax, even though it does take forever to use the saw and the ax. There are things you can say about it. like the chainsaw. When you use a chainsaw, you know, there's so much maintenance and there's oil and there's fuel and that you're always checking the chain and sharpening the chain and there's all this crap you got to do. You know, so that it comes and it's always like either breaking or there's some kind of problem or, you know, I don't know. It just feels like. If you're you, people go and and then they go and work out in a gym for the rest of the evening and they're just using machines all the way through where you work out sawing and chopping do it do it all at the same time there is a rationale to that even though i know to many it sounds crazy when i say stuff like this but i what do you think I, I, am, am i am i crazy no i don't think you're crazy but i i do think i would say to this and and, and kind of to help uh cultivate, you know, maybe, you know, a, a process of thought is that oftentimes um, when people begin to uh, explore the line of, of uh, uh, you know, a reactionary nature to modern technology, one of the things, one of the rhetorical paths that people sometimes fall down is that, um, you know, uh, justifying the use of more primitive scale technology based on efficiencies, based on benefit, based on, you know, whatever. And, and I, at some point in my thinking, something switched in me where I realized that, you know, using a chainsaw is easier. Yeah. It's easier. It's easier to do. You get more mm. work faster done. I have more time for other things. All of these things. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's easier. <laughs> it makes my life easier to use a chainsaw. Yeah. And that's not the point. The point is not to, <laughs> the rhetorical point is not to make it easier. It is to suffer and to be penitent in my labor. It is to, yeah. it is to go to my task and say, you know, this is harder. I'm choosing, I'm choosing to make this harder on myself because I have a penance to pay for the sins of modernity. Um, and so it's a penitent process um, rather than one where I'm trying to justify rhetorically that it has all these benefits that modern tools don't have or anything else. No, no, no. I, I, I just acquiesce. I take the path of humility now often and say, oh, yes, yes, it's, it's easier for me to use a chainsaw. However, I'm choosing to suffer. And in that, there's something beautiful that I think is obscured to you with your chainsaw. <laughs> which is a much different way to, to, to approach yeah. the issue. Yeah, that is, yeah, I would agree. But I, I just think all around, like even as you were saying, what if there's some sort of apocalyptic situation? Chainsaw, you know, without the chainsaw maintenance, ultimately your chainsaw is worthless in, in the long term, let's say that way. Absolutely. You know, your health is yeah. great from <laughs> forcing yourself in. 
no pain, no gain. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, sorry, I, am I? Did I break up? I think I've broken a, up a little bit. Well, you know, part of part of the assessment, though, you know, um, if you've ever used a saw and gotten to the rhythm of a of, of a handsaw and the sound of a handsaw and the feeling of using a handsaw, it's beautiful. That's why yeah. I do it. Oh, I love not, it. Which is not an assessment. Yeah, of, of, it's great. Of, yeah, it's beauty. <laughs> that that's why. You know, I work with a hammer or I yeah. make a timber frame. It's because, just, yeah. It's become fun. Yeah. I have, you know, and then you get a little workout while you're at it. So, stained glass. Sorry, we totally ignored you. What have you got? No, no, I agree. I was just listening to your philosophical pondering. It's amazing. It's, <laughs> I fully agree. Yeah. And I had the same, like, in the, if you live in the state, I was, I was just going to, yeah, if you live in the city, you don't have these these problems. You you just walk around and you don't have to the the opportunity to work out and just to fitness. And but while you're in the field, you you have this opportunity. So, but and and that's also uh, the question I was I'm going to is um, agrarianism. Like, how did you come to it? Yeah. It's the 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 how would you define it, <laughs> and how it has it influenced you? Um, well, You've already hinted a little bit at it, but not fully. I think in the way I read it online. <laughs> yeah. Um. For for me, uh, you know, the I my initial pursuit was to make a beautiful cider. <laughs> that was truly my initial pursuit, <laughs> and I realized uh, somewhere along that line that. Um, that I needed to control the trees that I was planting to get the right fruit, fruit for the blend of my barrels. And that brought me to, I need a farm to plant apple trees. And that brought me to the next step, which was how am I gonna take care of those apple trees and trying to just, a beautiful cider will emerge if the process is beautiful. And so just continually following what I kind of perceived as beauty in the process. And, and then this orientation of, you know, let's get back to the farm emerged. Um, and so that that's that's the practical way is that you know my agrarianism emerges from or my return to landscape and farming emerges from the pursuit of of a beautiful cider just because I liked drinking cider. <laughs> um, so, but um, as far as the political side, you know, or or more of an intellectual side or the, the pursuit of a just social order, I think that agrarianism uh, and I, again I can. It's hard, you know, everything's always tinted by what you're reading in the contemporary moment. So right now I'm reading quite a bit about the English uh, Catholic land movement. Um, it's about 1500 different uh, homesteads within a period of like 1920 to 1930 emerged uh, pre-war in England. And so, and it was part of the distributist movement. And so for me, um, I, I see the same thing is that a, a truly a distributed society is one that uh, a truly distributed society is one in which people own property and have the means on that property to care for themselves. And so agrarianism pairs uh, amazingly well with distributist thinking. And so, um, it, you know, uh, as far as like, you know, I can, I can continue to talk about just like what being an agrarian is. I think I'm, I think I'm, uh, uh, you know, Southern traditionalist thought in America um, affects the way that I think uh, uh, about about people's relationship to landscape. I think there's still, as an American, there's still uh, uh, this Jeffersonian ideal of agrarianism uh, is still exists in me, um, where you know you're you're a man with a family on a homestead and you care for yourself. You know. Um, <laughs> So that these things, uh, I think that still resonates with me somewhere. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't know. I think, I think just the general idea of that a just social order is one in which a, all the various city states are, there's a balance between the city and the rural that neither one consumes the other. Um, and that, and that in, in that balance is something beautiful and agrarianism would be part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Go yeah. On. Oh, yeah. So, um, that's like that. That's the opposite of our modern idea of urbanism, which is just to increase a sprawl of like cookie cutter houses with a perfect patch of grass. And when there's like a lot of space being used, 
that could have at least some agrarian localized agrarianism for each little patch of it you know it just they just don't bother like it would be to everybody's benefit but it's just not in the psyche to do it they just want to have their kind of houses go back and that's it i guess but uh it's the opposite of what you're saying what they're doing and which is spreading okay spreading more than no no it's okay. I'm, I'm, we're good. i've i don't remember what i was gonna say <laughs> no you dropped off you dropped off for me so uh i thought you stopped talking <laughs> oh, shit. oh sorry 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 yeah it cuts in and out a bit on my end sorry about that i might have cut out a few times even i don't know yeah, it doesn't matter i was going to say how uh your your thought is so anti-industrialism it's, it's so anti-industrialist like the industrialist thought is focused on efficiency and uh, it has to go faster and so quicker and and you you don't focus on how to get it but the, the it's actually a very holistic thought like you you take everything in consideration your own your own mental state and everything just it's I find it really, really interesting. I, I don't know if you. But, but over, I would say his efficiency is increased overall if you practice long term yes, thinking. Yes, yes, yes. He's he's, he's actually more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, f I, I fully agree. Just <laughs> this entry industrialist uh, view on farming. It depends on your priorities. Like the industrialist is his priority is to make more money for the middleman, you know, cut his little his little extra portion off his distribution networks or whatever he does. I don't know. He doesn't care about the any of these you, you could talk his first principles, he'd be like, What? <laughs> How does this enter into <laughs> anything? <laughs> so priorities are you know, and even Michael himself came to these priorities through trying to make a good cider. Which is yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> great with, oh, I was gonna ask you another question. Sorry, I have to ask. Did you buy your oak um caskets or did you make them? Because that is a I've come it's come to my attention recently, the sheer level of skill as in a cooper and making a barrel. Yes. Cooper's and it's amazing. Good. Yeah, no. So I, I, uh, for cider making, I've learned that um, if you use a brand new barrel, um, the cider ends up to, it's too much oak. Cider does not have the body to stand up to a new barrel. And so I buy all my barrels secondhand from wineries. Um, but I've found various wineries that will sell secondhand barrels. And so some of the tannins have been leached into the wine, kind of giving more of a neutral setup for my cider. And I have a couple of different types of wines that I like to use. And so I, you know, I, I, I find them here and there. And I do not, I am not a cooper. In fact, I, I wouldn't even consider myself too good of a carpenter. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a farmer carpenter, if, if that makes any sense. There's a, yes. there's a lot of wire yes. and, 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 you know, whatever's handy that happens when I'm, when I'm fixing things. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm not that great myself. I can do a few things, but I like I'm making a greenhouse right now, but it's 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 okay. It's not bad. <laughs> it'll it'll stay up. I, I say work, that. I work, it's all good. I work that? well under instruction, tutelage. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, YouTube and stuff like that is actually a great resource for things like I I've I've found that useful. I mean, even you were saying about the horse, you probably what little you did not find out about horses, did you get off the internet? I'm guessing. You were uh, watching videos. Yeah, I had some friends who, you know, knew knew a little bit, but that, but that lineage of tradition of really understanding how to care for a horse and 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 what a horse needs and how to pick a good horse and all these things were just all the subtleties yeah. were lost were lost on. And how, can I ask how many horses you have? Are you are you like breeding horses as well now? Or? No, no, I only had two horses, and and they've moved on to another farm at this point. So I, I no longer have uh, I no longer have horses, just sheep. I've simplified my farm a little bit okay. over the past year um, because of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had to uh, seek uh, work off farm now. So now I work uh, long days off farm uh, doing construction work and other things. And so, and so I'm not on, I got eight long years of just being able to be on the homestead, but unfortunately uh, that that's ended at this point. And so I, I work off farm to pay the bills now. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm gone for the good chunk of the day. And so I simplified and scaled back a little bit of our farm animals and other things. It's just goose and, uh, and sheep and chickens now. And that's all. Are you using the horses to till the soil or something? Is it her? Yep, yep, that was the idea. That was the idea. Whether or not I was ever truly, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was able to well, truly 
accomplished it. You know, I had I had grand schemes, but God has yeah. other plans for us all. <laughs> do you, well, you know there? Do you intend oh, to sorry. build it back bigger again, or is it uh, is it going to stay at this level? Uh, I am. You know, it's a. Uh, it's interesting over I, I turned 40 this year and so i feel very much in my 40th year that you know the 40 is a very important number right this just echoes throughout um throughout christendom the, this 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 40 and so i'm very much um trying to meet uh the work that uh god puts in front of me with um with humility and and with acceptance and with with you know joy in the vocations that i've been given with very little expectation of what may happen um uh, with them so to answer the question I'm, I'm i'm planning a lot less and just meeting the work of the day um as as it arises in the day you know i i look at the seasons and i understand the seasonal cadence and the things you know and summertime i chop wood and in in wintertime i carry wood and you know three if i get three dry days in summer i cut hay you know i when the apples are falling off the tree <laughs> is the time to collect them but the the landscape dictates a lot of my labor and then my pursuit of just providing for the needs of my family as a father puts me out into the world and and i do the work that's put in front of me as good as i can no matter what it is and so um and so it's, you know, it's changed as, as, as I've gotten older, I, I think as a younger man, uh, Wendell Berry, one, one of the writers that I really like, he has a beautiful essay where when you first have a dream of farming and you look at a farm, you dream about what you're able to do with the farm and you fall in love with your vision of the farm. And so you fall in love with your agency and your ability to change the place and all the things about you that you see your your uh, your work reflected in the farm. But then as you work longer years on a farm, things don't work. You know that you learn that the garden is better suited in a place that you didn't expect, and that the trees that you planted died, and that instead of pigs doing well, sheep do well, or instead of you know, and things change and. And you start to appreciate the trees on the farm and the birds that come back every season and, and the, the, the way the hill uh, changes colors in fall time. And you begin to appreciate things for the way they are. And in that process, you fall in love with the place as it is, not as a place for you to enact your agency. And then, and only then, do you truly fall in love with the place. But that process is one of humility, of the place instructing in you humility. And so I'm at that phase as a farmer where I kind of know what works and know what doesn't. I failed quite a bit. I've had my mild successes and I've had my moments of epiphany. And I feel a nice cadence in my life where I can go from season to season. I understand the work that I think I'm being asked to do, work that drives me to talk to you two gentlemen. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I just try and rise to it um, you know, as gently and graciously as I can. Um, but, and, but work hard, you know. Um, so... So that's it. That's, you know, that's, I don't really have a plan. I don't know what's necessarily going to happen next. We built a cabin to invite people onto our land. We'll be housing um, seminary students and then young men who are interested in learning traditional agriculture techniques. So we built a little timber frame cabin and I hope to put together um, a type of like, you know, I would talk to folks like I'm talking to you and say, what would you like to learn? And then set up a weekend where this gentleman would come to my farm and learn that thing. Is it butchering a sheep? Is it putting up loose hay? Is it making cider? Is it planting trees? Is it tending a garden? You know, whatever it is. And so we set it up and then work with that with that person. That's and great. hopefully, you know, they develop a skill uh, and, and, and get some instruction from the land here in the way that I have. Mm -hmm. And so... And so that's, that's really it. that's that's our plan but it's all it's all very um it's all very you know life is very mysterious to me if you would have told me when i was 19 that i would end up on a farm as a catholic as a <laughs> catholic with a bunch of kids i would have told you you were crazy you know? right. so, and all because you wanted some you wanted to make some some uh, cider yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly so here i am so um, no that's great that's great and that is a good idea i think that could be a very successful idea just the training courses i i would certainly do it if i was lived anywhere near you i'd go down and um I Maybe. wouldn't mind learning about how to how to proper how to properly process the sheep and that. I never did anything like that. And um, yeah. it reminds me of that guy. I used to see him on TV here. He's in the south um, there, Eustis something or other. Do you know this guy? No. Uh, he's like white. He looks like Santa Claus. He he runs a farm. 
somewhere in southeastern U.S. Like okay. um, um, used to something. I don't remember now because it's been years since I looked at him. But he does that kind of thing where he he's got a whole total um, you know, uh, home Conway. Set. Is that it? I think so. Could be, yeah. Traditional homestead, and he invites people on. He teaches them everything from like yeah. throwing slingshots and like all the stuff you're talking about, building um like a stone chimney, like an old fashioned old old American style, you know, proper stone chimney for a cabin, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I th believe he, I saw him. He's got a TV show about it, so he must be pretty successful. And I remember hearing him talk about um, harvesting what was it, um, molasses in the moonlight with a with a sickle, and like just only moonlight. And it just it just sounded so excellent. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you're bringing back memories to me. Yeah, Whatever. there's there's a great um, book. Uh, it's called the name. The title of the book is Better Off, and it's about a it's about a young Catholic who lives with an Amish community in America. And um, he, one of the things that this community does uh, is sits together and shells peas. They shell peas, uh, taking the peas out and plopping them in a bucket. And he's watching them do this day after day and he's partaking in it. And, and week after week, every week, there's the pea shelling time and they shell peas. And in his very uh, materialistic brain, he's calculating how much coordination it takes and how many calories they're burning harvesting and shelling the peas <laughs> and uh versus how many calories the peas offer and so he's you know doing all of his his math you know on on the paper um, about about this shelling of pea process and then maybe i think it's like a, a a half a year into it he realizes that the shelling of peas provides a social space for the people to relate to one another. And that's the point of it, that the point of it is to provide a kind of neutral space where you can act and work next to somebody shoulder to shoulder, but you don't have to focus on your friendship. You have a task, a very simple task to focus on. But in that you emerge a, a, a fellowship with one another that is very, very important as people move through their life. And so back to this idea of industrialism and farming, we lose these things, um, you know, so collecting uh, molasses by the moonlight of, you know, with a sickle, the payoff there is the process of doing it. You know, the molasses is just a byproduct. The beauty of that moment is, mm. is what, you know, is, is the gain. Um, and so the same, the same thing. And uh, I like, I really like the thinker, um, uh, Davalia, uh, Nicolas Gomez Davalia, um, who has a beautiful saying that um, uh, industrialism is yeah, something to the effect of industrialism is, is choking the source, uh, the industrialism of agriculture is choking the source of goodness on, uh, on the earth. And, uh, and it's very much, you know, when I think about all the various threads and how they intertwine, I think that's something that I want to get across to people that shelling peas is important. Harvesting with a sickle by moonlight is important. These things are important in and of themselves. And if we let these threads go, we'll be like me with my poor horse without a clue how to get back. You, you're you muted. Oh. And now he left. Oh, and now he's gone. <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> so... Um, Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yep, yep. <laughs> Great. At least, once, once a stream, once every stream, it happens that the mic yes. goes off and I have to unmute it. Don't ask me why. I don't know. Don't know. And I clicked on the wrong thing there, Mike. Sorry. Um, uh, one thing I want to say before I forget is like when you're talking about your land and how you have come to appreciate it. Also, that is uh, individual culture. Your land is unlike any other land anywhere else. Your little patch and what you've chosen to do with it. You are the husband of that agrarian patch, as it were. Right, yes. so it's got your your sweat and blood and your pers personality is in what it has become or will become. So you got a re little reciprocal agreement with the earth there, yes. and you have a unique culture as uh, you know everyone does in their in their own patch that they organize or they uh, what's the word I want to say husband again but you know keep or maintain. So that's you know. Cultural, not just cultural, like agrarian cultural, but like actual real culture too. Like your traditions that you form doing the work, as you were saying, like the the shelling the peas, you know, a functional ritual, like real ritual, like wassailing was wassailing was all developed around, I believe, cider, uh, harvesting apples for cider, you know, and it's like 
they, it's a continued tradition, even though the, no one's necessarily collecting the apples there anymore. In, in, in England, I should say. I don't think it's American one. Uh, I just wanted to say that. Sorry. <laughs> That's it. No, I think the more that you reach a communion with place, and one of one of the biggest poisons I think of modernity and and end of the American experience is organizing our is organizing our social orders around the rights of the individual rather than the rights of the community. Because when you really hone down on the individual, um, you get the individual divorced from a sense of place. Um, when, so what I'm trying to say is that um, as I cultivate my landscape, my, I, I, in a very, very real way, become my landscape and my, my landscape becomes me. Um, uh, my life and my who I am right down to the my material body becomes part of the landscape that I'm that I'm uh, 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 working with and communing with right the sheep eat the grass the grass comes from the soil I eat the sheep I eat the soil right so I'm, I'm very much part of my place um, and so when you commune in a piece of uh, with a piece of land like that um, the, these these patterns emerge of culture, and this is where culture comes from. And so, one of the um, one of the tragedies of the modern experience is that we all experience the sense of placelessness um, that that lacks culture, um, where you know your food comes from a thousand miles away, and it's not rooted to who you are, where you are, and so you have no um, you have no real sense of place, and in fact, a sense of placelessness and. Uh, kind of forever transgression of place occurs in the modern experience. And it's a, it's a huge tragedy because there is a richness to being where you are and who you are and being a people of a particular place and land. And, and, and th this is something that modernity is, is very much wounded in people. Um, I'm sorry. Mm. I think speaking yeah. to a little bit. It reminds more, me of the... Uh, it reminds me of It dropped. Yeah. We're developed. We're you. Oh, am I back? Am yes. I back now? Yeah, yes. I'm back. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Great. Um, humans were evolved to to move plants from different pots and to move them around places. As in, plants were the superior creature, and we were just our role evolutionarily, and you know, <laughs> our in God's plan is to move plants around. So in that sense, you are like the you are the you are the caretaker of, of your land. You've always been the caretaker, to quote The Shining. But so you are the sentience of the all the various life forms there who can manage and do things for them, <laughs> for the trees, for the apples, for the sheep. So you are the caretaker. Uh, whatever that means, you know, you are both beholden to them and they to you. But you're you're the sentient smart guy, who's <laughs> yes. you, know, you know you're beneath, you're beneath God, but you're in charge of that little patch. Yes. This is That's, this is the responsibility side of dominion that is often forgotten. I think is what you're speaking to. Yeah, yeah. So, um, stained glass. You've got any final questions or? Well, no. Actually, I find it <laughs> really interesting. Do you have any more questions, or is press? Um, I could ask him all day long, like specific questions. Keep asking. <laughs> Well, okay, one or two personal. Do you have more so time? I was thinking about getting. I, I, I was thinking about getting. I, I, I gentlemen, I do. I will have to end at an hour, so um, I, I do. I do have to get to my children. So um, yeah. So I, I, I'm okay for a couple more though. Okay, just like super quick, silly, practical questions. I was thinking about getting some chickens, and I keep um, the wife is on to me saying that they'll bring rats. Uh, do you keep chickens, and do they bring rats? <laughs> I keep I keep chickens, and um, I would encourage you rather than chickens. If do you have a little plot of land with some grass on it? Yeah, but we have All a right, dog so, too. So okay, okay. So rather than chickens, I would encourage you towards a goose or two. And the reason why I would encourage you towards a goose or two is because one, the goose is a much more hardier animal, so so they are likely to stay alive where a chicken won't. Two. A goose is a grazing animal. A chicken, you'll have to uh, import some type of grain or feed them your kitchen scraps, where a goose can actually eat grass and survive right off the grass. 
Okay. And then, and then so so you don't have to import a grain onto your into your house. You don't have to buy, and it's not the okay, chicken that's cool, that yeah. brings the rats. It's the grain that brings the rats. Right, right. As you right. drop the grain around, and so and then third mm. is that a goose um, a goose can uh, produce oils, and those oils can be used for cooking. So they're a very oily animal, and so you can get rid of seed oils in your diet by rendering a goose, um, collecting those renderings and then using mm. that to fry your various things in. And so a goo I always, when people, there's a, there's a big fad of like, everyone gets getting chickens and, 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 and I always want to counter it with get a goose instead. You'll be, you'll be happier. Um, and, 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 a, and a gaggle of goose, 30 goose on a small piece of property. It's like your own little army. You, you, the intruders <laughs> will run. So. Well, do you, do you keep those in a, in a coop or do you just let them go ever? I wherever? Keep, I keep mine in a coop. You know, you can get domesticated goose that will not fly away from you. You know, they just give them water and and let them graze you know an area and then you can feed them kitchen scraps in the same way that you feed chickens kitchen scraps you know because we're, we're right beside a stream and there's only like a wall like i could see them don't they like to go in water i don't know anyways i'd be worried too that the dog would kill them but maybe i mean that's that's a risk with chickens or anything <laughs> yeah yeah it's a risk with any type of poultry but a dog is less likely to kill a goose so is it <laughs> yes. i heard i heard goose can actually be like um well no this is canada geese the big ones in Canada, the, there's be a story that they can flap their wings together and break your leg or something like that. Yeah, they're 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 they're, they're, they're quite uh, they're, they're goose are a little bit more hardy and resilient than a chicken, although a good uh, rooster can can put up spit up. You know, a good a good rooster can fight a little bit too. Right, 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 right. Well, that's they great. They can guard Sorry. your home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> put armor on them and the, yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. armored goose like a yeah. room. <laughs> No, that's uh, that's all I'll ask for now because I could ask you a million questions. So I won't. I, I can, uh, you know, I'll ask I'm you privately on Twitter to, or something. Some other I'm always happy to talk with you again. Or yeah, if I'm, find me on Twitter. That's a great way to to connect with me. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you for having me on and and you know giving me access to more to more people. You know, it's I, I'm quite clumsy when it comes to reaching out um, uh, and 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 reaching people. So I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to more people. And if anybody has listened to, you know, wants to reach out with me, Twitter is a great place. Please reach out. I'd love to talk to you. And I, I you know, want to connect with more people around these things. If I've learned anything in eight years of homesteading and all this is that we need one another in order to make these things work. Um, people who understand what is true and good and beautiful in the world need to support one another in, in, in that emergence of what is true, good, and beautiful. And so um, I want to be there for other people and other young men who are making those steps. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, I hope you can because, yeah, you've got a lot of wisdom there. You've accrued a lot of wisdom through hard experience. Well, I'm through. a fool, but you'll, you'll learn that in time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, well done, well done. So, yeah, I guess we'll stop there, St. Glass. Um, I guess you don't have you have any parting words. I found it amazing interview. Thank you for coming on, and uh, I'll, I've invited you to an, some other uh, podcasts as well. But uh, I hope this one was fun with Aureus Press. Yeah, Aureus Press is the he knows it all. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He he brought me into the beauty here to see the beauty of, of the art. <laughs> I know I know about your posting on Twitter. That's what I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was great. Thanks a lot for talking to us. And um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, I could ask you a million things, but you're a very valuable man to know. I would say so. I hope right. people do well, see this and talk to you if you want to help well, them out I, a bit. I hope, hope yeah. to see you guys again. And uh, yeah, that's it. So talk to you later, guys. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.